Clash at Demon Head is a gated exploration platformer, or Metroidvania, if you prefer, where progress depends on the objects or items that you unlock along the way, and your route to get through the game is somewhat up to you. When Vic Tokai was developing this game, they clearly took inspiration from many popular games already out for the NES, so you can detect little bits of inspirational DNA from games like Mega Man, The Legend of Zelda, and of course, Metroid. And when you clash these ideas together, you get something mostly unique that still feels familiar. But let's talk about the cover of the game first, because it is just amazing. There's a weird one-armed demon that doesn't even look like it's trying that hard to grab at our guy. There's a, uh, pod racer in the top right. There's a skeleton being shot in the face. And I do not understand that perspective. Is the skeleton on the ground? Am I on the ground? Also, there's a weird sidewalk made out of glass triangles along this cliff. Can't explain that. Can't explain why our guy has a blaster for an arm here when he doesn't in the game unless he dons a special suit that you get later that covers his face. But his face is not covered here. That said, in the game, our main character does look like he fronted a Motley Crue cover band, while on the game's cover, he looks more like he has his own line of exercise VHS tapes. Or kind of like Josh Brolin as a Goonie. What else? Oh yeah, fun fact, this mountain back here, that's Mount Rainier in Washington State. Nah, that's not true. But anyway, what's up with this game? Let's find out. First, the story. According to the manual, it's the year 1990X. Let's say 7. 1997. That'll work fine. Our character, named Bang, yes, like the sound it makes when you smack a metal trash can, is the leader of a secret command called the Saber Tiger. Bang just completed a military campaign and is celebrating at the beach with his girlfriend when he receives an urgent message that Professor Plum, the inventor of the Doomsday Bomb, yeah, that Professor Plum, is being held hostage atop Demon's Head Mountain. If the bomb explodes, the world ends. Of course, it's the Doomsday Bomb, not the kinda bad day bomb. Full on Doomsday. So Bang has to get to the top of the mountain, rescue Dr. Plum, and have him deactivate said bomb. So Bang leaves his girlfriend behind on the beach because honestly, where else would you rather be when the Doomsday Bomb goes off? Now the game is very open-ended. After you make it through the first stage, you're presented with a map with options of where you want to go. Each node of the map is numbered, and each little node is its own stage. The goal is not to simply go straight up the mountain. Of course not. That's a linear concept. This is a non-linear game. You can go anywhere you want, because you'll need to hunt down the seven enemy leaders and their fortresses first. A few can be tricky to find, and you'll have to rely on clues you get from the stilted conversations with NPCs to figure out exactly where each is hiding. But more on bosses later. The gameplay itself is self-explanatory, for the most part. You can jump, you can squat, and heck, you can even climb walls. Pressing the B button will fire your weapon. Enemies are pretty easy to dispatch most of the time. They have predictable movements and only take a handful of hits from your base weapon. They do explode on impact though, and their explosions can hurt you. So the pacing isn't as fluid as something like Mario when he has firepower. You can't just run and gun through the levels. A big part of this game is the shop, and I found it a little aggravating to deal with. Early in the game, you can locate a shop by finding a floating shop icon. This lets you enter a little store that is obviously owned by Ron Jeremy. There are plenty of items here that can help you, including health replenishments, items to help you jump higher, suits that give you a more powerful attack or help you swim underwater and even through lava. And also, from the shop, you can buy and must buy more opportunities to use the shop. That's right, if you want to come back to the shop at any point, unless you find one of those floating icons out in the wild, you have to buy a shop visit. This becomes especially aggravating when you get to a point in the game where you need something from the shop to proceed, but you have no more shops in your inventory and you have to go out and hunt for shops. Worse is that the shop has a mind of its own with the items it stocks. There's probably a way to reliably figure out what will be for sale, but items are not always available for some reason when you need them. And so you will have to buy multiple shop opportunities just so you can leave and come back to see if what you need is finally there. This is a total hassle. You know how great it feels when a store doesn't have that one thing you need? Yeah, that really sucks. Let's put that in a video game. Again, the gameplay 
pretty straightforward, but you can count on getting stuck and not knowing where to go a few times. That's just how it goes. But you'd do yourself well to take notes about the stages and what was in them. If you encounter a boss you can't quite defeat yet, jot down where that was because you'll need to come back for it eventually. The bosses are quite challenging here and can take a few tries to defeat. You'll die quite a bit in this game, but no worries, there are infinite continues that return you back to where you were on the map screen, so not too punishing at all. There's also a password system. And wouldn't you know it, you have to buy saves too. Yeah, you have to go to the shop and purchase a micro recorder, which essentially just gives you a password to jot down. Totally convoluted and unnecessary, but more annoying than game breaking. I know it sounds like I'm slagging on the game pretty hard, and it's not perfect, for sure, but it has a lot going for it. Exploration is fun and rewarding, which is why the light punishment for dying is so nice here. The music is decent and fitting, but does get repetitive, with the same track often restarting each time you enter and exit an area. The game looks great, nothing too mind-blowing animation-wise, but the visual design is clean, and the stages are mostly intuitive thanks to how clear things are drawn. It also feels good to play and controls well. Nothing about that aspect stands out as particularly above or below average to me. The big thing with this one is first, figuring out where to go and how to get there, and two, just dealing with the freaking shop. Despite that, this is definitely a game I'd recommend to anyone looking for a well-put-together, generally balanced, and decently substantial adventure on the NES. Well, the road ends here for our guy, Bang. There were never any sequels or even ports of this one. However, the lasting legacy of Clash at Demon Head was given a boost by the movie Scott Pilgrim, where one of the bands was called The Clash at Demon Head, as a tribute to both the band The Clash and the game we're covering here today. And that's going to do it for Clash at Demon Head on the NES. As always, never buy anything from Ron Jeremy, and thanks for watching.